So Professor um, Bart Jacobs uh, from the uh, Rothbaut University. Uh, then Mr. Uh, Allar uh, Lanelet, Minister of Economic Affairs and Communications from Estonia. Uh, Professor Christoph Lutke uh, from Te Technical University of München. And Professor Meli Skull, uh, PI of the Estonian Center of Excellence in AI. So we have one hour for discussion, uh, for the discussion, the panel discussion, and then we will have some time for the Q and A uh, afterwards as well. So we we managed to discuss briefly before the the various aspects of AI, what is important to make AI trustworthy and and correct and ethical and safe. And we also realized that there might be an element of like humans in this formula somehow. And then that the, uh, the XTI center that brings together the academia, the public sector, the private sector is probably in a pretty decent position to start finding answers to some of these questions. So um, to kick off the discussion, my, my first question would be, first of all, so in the context of security, correctness and ethics in AI, in this context, what is, in your opinion, in your experience, the current coolest initiative in the world that is, through, that is trying to address one or more of these areas? So security of, a, of AI, correctness of AI, um, and the ethics of AI. And then, together with that question, so what is the coolest initiative running somewhere at the moment? The second question is, how can we increase trust in AI, in your opinion? And I will start from here. I will hand you the microphone as well. Thank you very much. My name is Bart Jacobs. I'm from the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. I'm a professor there of uh, computer security and privacy. Uh, uh, but I also have a background in theoretical computer science. Uh, 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 my training is in logic and time theory. Um, the last few years I've been working more in, uh, more in probabilistic logic, trying to reason uh, with probabilities. And this is extremely difficult. And the, the area has various challenges which can be summarized uh, uh, by saying there's a big difference between causality and correlation. And AI is all about uh, uh, correlation, that things happen together and, and uh, finding a causal connection in there is a big, big challenge. A typical example I use for this, there's a high correlation uh, you can find in houses between the presence of ashtrays and the occurrence of lung cancer. And this is, this is just statistical correlation. But it doesn't, uh, uh, there's no co uh, causality. You see uh, directly that something is missing in the analysis here, namely the fact that people smoke, which is technically is called a confounding factor. It, it, it gives rise to the presence of these ashtrays and also the presence of, uh, of lung cancer. And it shows so easily that you can get confused or, or your analysis can be incomplete if you only look at uh, correlation. So I'm very much interested in, in uh, these topics and I'm happy that, that this is part of the XI initiative. So you asked about the coolest initiative. Well, I <coughs> yeah, there, there are various initiatives in the, uh, the, this area which I'm uh, also involved in, but let me name another one. I think the AI, AI Act in Europe is the coolest initiative. I'm try, uh, trying to regulate this. We just had a very nice uh, presentation uh, 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 about it. And this is the big, uh, a big challenge. And it touches upon the things uh, that I just mentioned. <coughs> Gabriele said that it's not a te technology that's going to be regulated, but the, the applications, the use cases. <coughs> but in these cases, uh, uh, some compliance or conformance will have to be shown. And it's unclear yet what form that will take. 
will uh, providers of AI technology in the end have to prove mathematically somehow that their system is really about causality uh, hey? or just correlation. Uh, let me give a concrete example. If a bank decides for a customer, you don't get this mortgage because you drive in a blue car and we have seen that people in, who drive blue cars don't pay their mortgage, that is not acceptable as an argument. <coughs> and, some, and somehow um, um, <coughs> we have to develop systems and also uh, proofs or, or, or demonstrations that these systems really behave rational in a certain sense or, or acceptable are based on, on a causal uh, connections. So that's uh, that was the first question, and the second question was how about... How can we increase trust? How can AI? we increase... Uh, as a scientist, I would say giving more proof uh, of, of that these systems really conform to, to certain uh, standards. Um, whether that's, that's uh, sufficient, I don't know, but maybe we should leave that for a next round in the discussion because okay. I've, I've been talking already for a long time. I'm happy to pass on the mic. Thank you. Uh, Alan. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I do agree that uh, the uh, AI Act is, is uh, quite, uh, I'd say, yeah, quite cool initiative. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding the uh, trust, uh, I think that when when something is transparent and, and people understand the processes and, and how the decisions are being made then then that's certainly one way to to gain trust uh, on the other hand uh, people have to be well educated uh, from from the lowest level to the highest so so education i guess is also one of the keywords in order to to when, when something is transparent but we don't understand what we see, then it's also a problem. So when we understand something, then it's more easy to trust it. And, and if we understand it and we don't trust it, then I guess there is a reason for that. Do you want to go for uh, like the coolest initiative as well? Uh, the coolest initiative, uh, yeah, I, I agree that uh, that the uh, um, AI Act is, is a really cool initiative, uh, but, uh, but the coolest initiative, <coughs> Yes, one thing that, that I cannot uh, cannot not mention is uh, is the bureaucrat uh, that we are doing. That's that's the that's the project where we implement all those keywords and and where we uh, make all those decisions happen and uh, and implement the ethics, uh, trustworthiness, transparency, and so on, equality. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christoph? Yes, thank you. Um, I will, let me just um, give a quick introduction to what I do and what I am. Because I, I have a background both in information studies as well as uh, philosophy. We just talked about that. And um, uh, I have uh, been running uh, this Institute for Ethics in AI since 2019. So at the time when this was not, well, it was starting to become the hive maybe at, at the time. Um, but, well, it hasn't always been like that. I remember the first efforts we had here in Brussels, actually, on ethics in AI uh, in around 2017, 2018, uh, with the AI for People and the High Level Expert Group. Actually, one of my collaborators at that time is here in the room, Robert Madden. Um, and um, it's, it's great to see now these efforts being taken further. And, and one of the, or maybe the key issue uh, that we wanted to solve is how to make these systems trustworthy. So I, I would say trust is at the core of everything, of, of both uh, uh, security, both um, um, uh, ethics and, and the like. Um, and how can it be achieved? I think this, is, this has been the whole point of ethics principles, of the, the principles of the high level expert group, one of them being explainability, for example, uh, and advancing explainability. Um, I think this is still one of the key, both technical and non-technical uh, issues uh, in order to uh, install uh, trust or to make people, or hopefully make people believe or trust in the, these systems. Um, and so I would say um, you do not achieve trustworthiness just by uh, making some kinds of, some sets of guidelines and putting them on the wall. 
but it's something that has to be implemented in the development process as a cooperation between people with tech, both technical background and non-technical backgrounds. And I think that's a key challenge here, um, because then you really start to implement it and not just think about it. And, uh, and now let me come to the, to the coolest thing, uh, is I would actually not single out an in initiative like that. The AI Act has been already mentioned, so I don't have to mention that again. Uh, what I believe should be mentioned is also initiatives um, that focus on the ethical opportunities of the technology. Uh, so not so much only those uh, which try to combat the challenges. Uh, EU, EU AI Act would combat the challenges. But the opportunities in itself, I mean, for example, autonomous driving in itself would be a good thing to have if it uh, leads to reducing fatalities on the streets, having fewer accidents, um, and, and that's why I, I would I would focus on on um, issues, for example, that um, help uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. And, and uh, one one favorite example I, I like is is all those systems that collect data about well maybe plants, uh, but also endangered species around the world. So you have sensors, you have um, uh, software systems that collect this data and you find out where uh, maybe species endangered of getting extinct. And this is an example uh, that I like very much. It's not a very new one, but I wanted to say it's, it's important that we don't lose sight of AI being in itself something that's not just dangerous and, and that's not just uh, something we need to restrain, but we also should see how we can unleash that force with some constraints, yes, but unleash that force for ethical opportunities. Thank you. Meris? Uh, trust is something that uh, is really hard to win, as we know, as humans, and, and, and it's very easy to lose. And um, Europe is um, aiming its beak in, in uh, already long, long, I mean, GDPR, is, is all about uh, winning the trust of people. It, AI acts also uh, about winning the trust. Um, and how do we gain trust uh, as, as uh, people? Uh, we we uh, often listen to other people's opinions, we hear from them, uh, we uh, kind of um, look at the um, kind of successes of others and, and, and see what is behind them and, and uh, hope to, well, and, and gradually build trust. So um, getting to this um, kind of initiative and, and, and achievement, I think uh, Estonia uh, has particularly uh, been able to get people to trust the digital digitalization of the state and, and, and the systems. And this is something that uh, uh, I hope uh, can actually also help to spread uh, across uh, more widely in Europe. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of digital initiatives everywhere, uh, a lot of AI initiatives everywhere. Um, it's particularly hard to, to get them spread and to convince people that actually it is possible to do things in an ethical way, in a trustworthy, secure way. Um, but of course that, that takes a lot of effort and, and we must admit there are many ways in which uh, researchers still don't know how to do things either and uh, there is a lot of research to do and I believe uh, uh, this kind of a collaboration uh, as, as XTI is putting forward uh, to bring together both the technical side but also the ethical and, and uh, security sides are crucial to get that initiative on um, trust. It's really about that. Um, and about like the coolest thing out there at the moment? I um, heard about the uh, possibility that uh, you can prove uh, that a particular um, large, uh, large neural network did not use someone's data uh, without having to reveal everything in the process. So you can kind of zero knowledge prove, uh, give a zero knowledge mathematical proof that uh, a piece of data was not used in the training process, which I found 
exciting. Maybe it doesn't scale yet to the kind of uh, chat GPT uh, level models, but uh, there is some interesting research there. Among other things, I guess, also whether AI can lie or not. Um, okay, so the next question. We do sometimes, or often, we, we talk about market forces and the, the power of the, the private sector in, in solving challenges and then helping us advance technology and so on. So, why should we care about things like security and, and correctness and ethics? Like, why should the academia get involved in this and research and discuss and debate? And why should the public sector get involved with this? Why should we not just leave it out for the, uh, for the pub private sector to figure it out? Let the market show what is secure, what is correct, what is ethical. And then once we have figured it out with the market forces, mostly driven by the private sector, then we will make use of it in the uh, public sector as well. So why should we care? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to react to this because you're, the positive picture you, you paint of the private sector is surely meant provocatively <laughs> be, because it's totally untrue. <laughs> it's totally untrue. If we look at social networks, social, I hesitate to call them social, and what kind of destructive, destructive influence they have on our current society, this is all driven by, uh, by private market forces. It's, it's driven by attention economy, trying to keep people as long as possible on the networks. This, uh, this attention focus on keeping people hooked leads, leads to very destructive forms of polarization. That is commercially inter interesting, uh, to, to drive you to the corners of, of uh, what is uh, reasonable and far beyond. And, and leaving this to the private sector, the whole AI framework <coughs> is going to be even far, far more destructive. I really worry about this, that I, I, the idea <coughs> that we have in liberal democracies uh, uh, based on, on voting in combination with uh, um, the, the <coughs> state of law, but this, that this voting is not going to work anymore. And we've seen this already in 2016, how, uh, in the, in the uh, Brexit uh, thing and the American elections, how, subsept, how, uh, how easy it is to influence uh, people. This is going to get far worse with uh, AI technology, with uh, chat GPT based, generated very, very reasonably uh, looking messages, which can be ultra, become ultra personalized and, and the idea that uh, uh, elections work somehow, reflect the opinion of the, of the uh, uh, population, will have to be changed. I mean, uh, it's so easy to man manipulate uh, people, and this is very worrying. The traditional idea of uh, elections is that uh, people go to a voting booth. Uh, in, the, in the Netherlands there are all kinds of regulations that in the voting booth no political advertisement is, uh, is allowed anymore. And the idea we have, we isolate people there. You go into a, a private voting booth, you're not, while you're there you're not allowed in principle to communicate with others. Uh, we're trying to, to express, uh, to, to, to create circumstances where people individually express their vote according to their own opinions. I think this, this idea is going overboard, especially if we leave this to the private sector. And I think really the public sector to, uh, should step in, in in this area very forcefully to, to protect public values in the digital world. And this has not happened over the, over the uh, or not enough. Europe is doing something, but this has, has not happened enough of the last 10, 20, 30 years. And this created the chaos that we're, we're in now by, this, by these interests of the private sector. You could say, yeah, they take care of security. You could say Facebook takes care of security <coughs> in, this, in the sense that uh, no other organizations access the data that they have. They do this very well, uh, but only because of their company interests. 
they're happy to share the, the data with other uh, uh, companies if they can sell them. That is not uh, 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 security, so they, that's not privacy, I should say. So, so uh, uh, Facebook is very good in security, you could argue, but not in privacy. And it's good to, to separate uh, uh, these two, and we will have the same problems uh, with AI, far worse, I predict. And with, I think with the like voting is a good example as well, because there's another aspect of, of rewards. So traditional elections, the reward is delayed. So your favorite party gets in power, and it's going to take them a year, two, three years, three years to achieve what they have promised. Whereas if the reward is proposed or suggested by, let's say, technology, so if you vote the right way, you will get something you wanted quicker than people might tend to choose that over a delayed reward. Uh, I'm not sure if I fully get your point. Okay. So it's, it's um, so the technology is kind of, the world, framing the world, around, the world around you, and the more convenient it is, the better it is for you, so if you mm -hmm. feel safe in there. So it, it kind of changes the way you see, the, see things, and then it makes you believe, in a way, that, that this is the right thing to do, and then once you have voted in a certain way, that has been presented as the way forward, then you will get some kind of instant reward. So the world become, it will become even more pleasant for you because of technology surrounding you relatively quickly. So like you choose the, the right path and the benefits of that right path you will feel the next day after elections. Whereas if you, if you elect a politician based on the promises on, on billboards, then they might or might not be able to achieve them. But in any case, it's going to take a few years. So you can, have, you can get some feedback quicker uh, if you're going kind to of force into that one, let's say, correct way of thinking. Yeah, poss possibly. Uh, let me stay, step back a little bit here in, in addressing this issue. So, the, uh, so I'm a co I consider myself a computer scientist, <clears throat> and the traditional uh, uh, view has been that computer scientists are the architectures, uh, architects of the digital world. That has changed. Uh, I mean, the computer scientists are now the architects of the social world as well. And, that, and we should not leave this area completely only to, to computer scientists. It's, it's much broader, the, the interests are so high. And that's why I'm, I'm very supportive of this broader initiative, this extra initiative, which also involves uh, people from ethics and, and from law who, who can help to regulate uh, uh, this, because it's really societal aspects at stake. And in the beginning it was mentioned in the introduction that there is this fear that AI will destroy humanity or, or, and, and typically the pictures are then related to warfare, uh, etc. I'm not so worried, as long as we don't uh, connect nuclear missiles to AI technology, I mean, and I hope there are still some, some wise people who are not going to do, do these kind of things, I'm not so worried. I'm much more worried about the societal influence, the undermining of the democratic process, that is immediate. And that is what we should worry about. And this killer AI thing is, is just, I, I think, um, it's sometimes seen as a, as a side argument which prevents us from talking about the real uh, things. Okay, Thank I'm you. happy to pass Thank on you. that. Hello. So why should, why should we care? Why should academia, why should the public sector get involved? Let's just let the market sort it out. Yeah, uh, that's, that's actually one question that I get asked quite often uh, because we are uh, doing a project which uh, sort of mirrors what the, what the uh, private sector does as well. So the bureaucracy is basically the chatbot uh, which allows you to, to, co to consume digital services through the, through the chatbot. And, uh, and the private sector often asks that uh, why, why should a uh, ministry or, or, or institution do that? Uh, let, let us do, do this task. Um, one, one key factor is uh, who, who is uh, the owner of the data. Uh, with, uh, when, when the public sector is, is developing uh, uh, things like that, then the data remains with the data owner. They, they know what they are doing with the data. It doesn't go to 
some sort of other platform to to chat GPT, Meta, whatever, uh, whatever other place, uh, and uh, and uh, that's that's a uh, one one key factor because expectations for the for those systems have uh, have raised uh, massively in in the past year uh, when when we had the chatbot I don't know one and a half years ago then then you didn't expect to get answers do you expect to get from there today so private sector uh, might cut corners uh, regarding the uh, safety and uh, and security uh, which the public sector cannot allow to do uh, for themselves so I guess that's that's one of the one of the main reasons also accessibility and inclusion of, uh, of everybody uh, private sector may not have uh, uh, interest to to include everyone uh, for for some services. They they are oriented on profit. Uh, they are not just doing those things to to ma to make people happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Krista. So you are asking why should we leave it to the market? But. I mean, the market is not just the market, especially when it comes to Europe. And in Germany, we have this term, the social market economy, but it doesn't have to be that. But the market is always working with certain rules. If you leave markets to themselves, normally they degenerate into something which is not, which we don't want, which does not generate what, what we want. So, so we need some, some rules for markets. I, th I think this is, this is quite clear. Um, to what level that has to go, and to what level the regulation has to go. That's another question. And I, I have been working in business ethics for many years, and well, of course, there are a lot of regulations of economics, uh, of, of business practices, but there is also a lot that is going on in the private sector from their own initiative and in, on, in their own interest. And some of that you might call ethics washing or green washing, but not all of that. So uh, a lot of that has also achieved a lot. Um, so I, I would not underestimate the own interest of companies, uh, for example, trying to avoid reputation damage, um, uh, also fines that, that may come. Um, uh, so I, th I think there is a lot of interest in those. And, and, and then I have to ask the other question, can the public, no, no, the, the public sector really do it better? And then I'm, I'm, I'm a bit cautious, a bit more cautious than you, maybe. Um, I didn't say the public oh, sector do, okay. do, can do so that. Because you know, then there are a lot of issues as well. And do people really trust uh, public authorities to, to use technologies in the proper way if just left to their own devices, they, 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 all this uh, dangers of surveillance that, that uh, come up? Um, if you look at, for example, the Chinese regulation, because that's sometimes cited as an example, but well, China has the best regulation or the most regulation of AI, but it's only uh, this, uh, focused on private companies. So or, uh, public authorities, it has no regulation, basically, what, you, what they can do. So, so that's why I would, I would be a bit cautious. So I think we should, we should be worried about both and see how we can uh, unleash the potential, again, what I said before, unleash the potential of AI for good, for humanity, if you want, uh, within certain rules. Thank you. Melis? Uh, so, yes, first about uh, why, why not leave it all to the private uh, sector. So, in their, the rewards that they are working for um, tend to be short term, first of all. Um, they, uh, for example, to, they, they are also interested in getting the AI systems to be trustworthy, but their interest is a lot more shallow. I mean, what they need it for is for people to kind of next day to, to, to use it and then the states maybe to note that yes, this follows some regulation, but, but they, they have a lot less uh, motivation to work kind of uh, long and deep on these kind of things. Uh, so this is really where, where academia uh, has an advantage and particularly also that the, the tech companies tend to have a, a certain set of people um, with, with certain sets of skills and, and, and it's not in any way comparable to the broad uh, uh, kind of a set of skills and knowledge that academia can bring together. 
um, in such kind of the centers um, from really many different disciplines. Uh, a bit regarding the risks, I mean, uh, uh, Kaimer really nicely highlighted a lot of risks that AI brings, um, and uh, many they are um, very long term as well. Um, but I think one one key point is is that some some of those risks are just that because AI is not uh, done properly. Uh, people who, who kind of uh, implement those AI systems don't care enough. But um, there are also kind of, um, what, what this kind of center can do is, is to um, show how to do things as well as possible. And even, the, even this is very, very hard, right? Uh, uh, with neural networks uh, that are not uh, easy to prove uh, mathematically anything about. So it's very hard. But if, if done well, uh, it is possible to kind of give a showcase of how well this uh, AI system can be shown to be secure, ethical, and uh, correct. And that can then uh, gradually spread also to uh, private sector solutions, because then they already have an example towards which to uh, aim for. Otherwise, they, they just lack enough uh, motivation to, to push forward in this. Thank you. Next one. <laughs> Thank you. Back to you. Uh, another question yet? So oh, but you, maybe you want to start on that side. No, first, yeah? no, no. <laughs> um, so XTI, as every other research center, of course, requires funding and needs to prioritize the work that they do. So somewhat wishful thinking, but also in regards to prioritization. So in the context of something like XTI, so you have the private and the public sector and academia working together. You have the power of the state behind this as well, small as it be, but still. Um, and you have international partners as well. Now the wishful thinking part, no limits on the budget. I know it's like for academia it's very difficult to imagine, but there's like no limits on the budget. For a research center like XTI, and considering it, there's applied research as well, it's not just thinking about it, well, it's unfair, it's not just thinking about also the doing. So working with the private sector to push some of these ideas out into the real world. What would be the one, two, or three key questions that would be useful to focus on, or where we absolutely should focus on, given the opportunity to do, re to do research in such a way, so public, private, academia coming together, working internationally, and having access to the private sector and the state, so we can think, design, test, and learn. Mm -hmm. One, two, or three key areas, key questions that we should uh, look answers uh, for. Yes, shall I? Yes, yes, yes please. Well, <coughs> Um, one of the uh, problems, or if you like, good things uh, about Europe is that it's a regulatory power. Uh, 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 so so uh, Europe is very good uh, in developing regulation and less in developing technology. So the main example is the GDPR, of course, which has global influence, so, so, so Europe is doing very well there. But the big problem of Europe is that we don't have the technology, we don't develop the technology ourselves in which our values can be embedded. And European values are really different from uh, American values, from, from Chinese va uh, values. Uh, and, and you see this, these three big blocks in the, in the world where Europe is the regulatory power. You see the same thing happening with the AI Act uh, uh, now. If, if I had uh, unlimited budget, I would invest in developing this technology uh, uh, ourselves. And no, not only do the more reflective oriented research that now is, now is uh, uh, being proposed in, uh, in next time, very, very important. Uh, but in the end, this, this project depends on others developing the technology and embedding the technology uh, uh, in there. So the big budget 
do it ourselves, build all the things on ourselves. Of course, your next question is, how realistic is this? But your question was already a bit unrealistic. Yeah. But hopefully this answers it. Thank you. Yeah, what are the key elements? I, I guess one thing that we lack of really is uh, are those uh, high level experts and high level specialists. So we definitely need to have some sort of uh, competence center for that central competency and uh, and uh, we need to uh, I guess uh, educate people and uh, make them more um, capable of, of uh, data literacy or, or man data management from the from the from the ground level uh, uh, to, to the top so I guess uh, uh, the education part is, is uh, one of the key factors actually to make it long lasting and uh, and, uh, and not, uh, not not short uh, short project uh, on the other hand I, I really do uh, agree that uh, that making those things ourselves is, is one of the is one of the key factors uh, so when we uh, create the competencies then, then there is a place to, to use it as well to implement it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah. I would, um, I would say th those are two points for me. Uh, the first point is, is this um, close collaboration between the tech people and people doing the ethics of it. And um, I think we have achieved um, something during the e years. My worry is currently that this is being replaced by mere box ticking. And that's why. I have a slight worry for the AI. Let's see how this turns out. But it, it might turn out that the developers are just, well, we have now some piece of software that's taking care of that, and that's that. So box taking, box taking, and so on. So often we don't need ethics. We don't need to worry about ethics anymore. Hopefully that is not the case. Um, so, but still, this collaboration is important. And the second point um, I want to make is, um, since, since you, you also said we need to uh, develop this technology. We, 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 not just the regulation, but we need to have the systems, uh, the software. Uh, we need to help the startups uh, because AI is really a field where we now in Europe we have some startup culture already going on uh, in Munich as well. So uh, I, I just recently saw some statistics where it turned out that TU Munich is the, the university with the most AI startups coming out of it worldwide. I'm not sure it's true, so maybe not. But, but still, uh, it, it seems to be a lot. And, and there is a problem. We, we need to make uh, sure we do not suffocate this culture. Uh, because if we, if we do suffocate that, then we are worse off than before uh, when compared to both the US and China. That's the reality uh, we face. So uh, we need to see, if, especially if we have unlimited funds, I would say, well, we need to help those turn into a, a further growing industry and, and then we can really say we have developed something in Europe um, that is also helping us uh, and helping uh, our position in the world while at the same time also advancing our values. Can I agree to that? No, we'll later. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, premium beat, yes. Yes, um, premium beat. Um, I think um, one problem that we are currently seeing with AI systems is that they just fail us in really, well, unexpected ways, you could say. I mean, by now we are already maybe getting used to being failed, so maybe it's not so unexpected anymore, but kind of a, a large language model hallucinating, well, um, and failing us in various other ways. So I mean, it's very, very powerful but just fails uh, occasionally. So if we kind of compare that to the human world, um, we, whatever kind of systems uh, that we have where humans are playing uh, critical roles, we also need to kind of make sure that those humans don't fail us, right? I mean, nuclear station somewhere, we don't want the people who run that nuclear station to, to fail us. And so uh, what are the ways to guarantee uh, as well as possible uh, to 
uh, achieve safety, uh, trustworthiness, all of that. So um, I think we, we need to um, get the AI to that level, but uh, the, the challenges are then how. And um, of course, getting smarter and smarter, um, AI models um, maybe le make less these kind of mistakes, but being a neural network, there are just some kind of fundamental problems with that, uh, with trustworthiness. So what I'm dreaming of is, is um, uh, methods where um, kind of uh, neural networks can prove, output proofs about them being correct in certain ways. And uh, um, when, when that's possible and when it's not possible, uh, outputting risk assessments uh, the, way, the same way as kind of nuclear station needs to really to really really careful risk assessment, uh, and furthermore, not only risk assessment uh, in advance uh, when before it gets open, but but kind of continuous uh, dynamic risk ass risk assessments, even like when things get wrong. So the autonomous car should kind of at any point uh, run dynamic risk assessments to be able to take care of the unexpected uh, circumstances that were not even possible to include through training. So, but to achieve all that, <laughs> of course, uh, many different fields need to come together, uh, logic verification, probabilistic reasoning, um, but then also for the requirements side, I mean, what do we, what do we want from these systems? Correctness, security, uh, so ethics, uh, all this needs to come together. So the center, uh, XTI center, is, is a small piece towards that, but dreaming deep, uh, I hope uh, a lot more can come uh, out of it uh, in the long run. Thank you. You can keep the mic for the moment. Um, so with the cars, of course, like the dynamic calculation, real-time calculation, so essentially, if you paid more for your car, it will run now with a pedestrian, it, if you paid less for your car, it will crash you to, into the wall. Like that, yeah? That, that's a question to my... Uh, <laughs> so you wanted to come <laughs> Christoph here, I think, uh, getting very complex ethical questions, yes. Oh, yeah, and I'd like to react to what Christoph was just saying. I'm happy we agree on the need for European technology. And, and I think the European Commission is also realizing that, and they have since, since I think Ursula von der Leyen, they, uh, von der Leyen, they emphasize digital sovereignty as a, as a big topic in Europe and in XI, we should try to connect to that as well. Big, uh, digital sovereignty is, is important. <clears throat> I sometimes make a joke on, uh, about this sort of form. What we do in Europe is we run American software on Chinese hardware. Where did we go wrong? Eh? Where did we go wrong? And that, uh, that is the si uh, situation, uh, really. Um, what Christoph was saying, we need to stimulate the startup uh, uh, culture. I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, that because I would claim in the ICT sector the market does not function. The, we have a couple of so big players, so big players, that there is no market freedom and economy anymore. Whenever startups arrive, when, when the technology is interesting for them, they buy them up. When the uh, technology is threatening for them, they also buy them up and then kill the company. I mean, there is no market uh, uh, in that sense. So, I, uh, okay, we should stimulate these kind of initiatives, but I would immediately say we should also protect these kind of uh, initiatives against such, such hostile ta and takeovers. So it should be really a guided uh, market in that sense, and Germany has a tradition in that, in that you, you mentioned it as a social market economy. But we really need, in that, in that sense, uh, more policy-oriented or approaches, more regulation-oriented approaches, and not just on the market, but the, because the market has led us to these monopolies where there's no freedom, anymore, freedom of choice anymore, and, and uh, where the risk of manipulation is very big. There's a recent, a recent uh, one or two years ago, nice book about this that I can recommend to everyone. It's called The Digital Republic. 
written by a Brit, Jamie Susskind, uh, which, which deals with these kind of issues from a Republican perspective, uh, not a liberal perspective, but a Republican perspective. That's a, a, a view on freedom, on human freedom, which puts the notion of domination at the center of its, of its uh, deliberations. And I think th that is the, the kind of terms that we should think in. The market is dominated uh, by, by certain uh, players, and that is the uh, 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 dynamics that our regulation should, should focus on, and not the liberal, new, your liberal idea of, of anyone can do this and we should uh, uh, stimulate each, each kind of initiative, because it's leading nowhere at this stage. Maybe you want to react to this, uh, Chris. Yeah. Maybe just a bit of, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Certainly, oh. I mean there are it's a double negation. companies <laughs> that are uh, well, but still competing against each other. I mean, we have competition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Google uh, also developing AI, Microsoft being there with Open AI already. So they, I would say, still say there is competition, and of course, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean we shouldn't um, stimulate the startup culture because there's a lot going on more than it. I would say more than that has been going on in Europe in the last 20 or 30 years in this sector, at least that's my impression. Maybe not everywhere it's the same, but um, I think we should stimulate that. And, and I would agree that some bigger players should also be supported. Um, we have a problem with venture capital in particular in Europe. That's, that's a key problem here. Um, uh, but I mean, yeah, in the, in the, especially in the generative AI sector, I think there's, there's a lot of potential now with that all over Europe, uh, not just Germany, in, in France, but also everywhere, in, in Estonia, certainly. Uh, and, and I think, so, I would say this should be stimulated. Yep, you can keep them still, you can keep, keep yours. Thank you. Um, one of the things Pablo mentioned was, was the amount of, of free money on the market, or the available money on the market. And it seems to be increasing at the moment. Um, and it is, a lot of this is going to the big players. There's plenty to go to smaller ones as well, if they get the support. So a center like XNA can help with that, but it, we need to figure out how the hub and spoke model would actually work. So if you have something to attach the money to, that is trusted, works well, and so on. So it might be actually, actually possible to, to kind of, almost like a build a net to capture some of that money from the market. Another thing that Pablo mentioned was the brain drain from Europe. So we, we train or we educate our people, but they will go somewhere else, well, especially the U US, um, to work in, in AI companies or in the AI field. So starting with you, what can we do in the next three to five years, because it's an acute problem, what can we do to stop the brain drain or to start bringing European scientists back to Europe, considering that we don't actually have unlimited money, and we do need to make it work across the public, the private, and the and academia. Uh, yeah, that's a super good, good and important question that is very, very hard to answer. But uh, I mean, people um, um, want to live well. They want to um, have an exciting job uh, and uh, supporting environments, interesting people around them. So uh, that's what we need to offer. Um, but the key question is, is how. And, uh, and I think um, for talent, uh, having more talent around them is, is critical uh, because that's, uh, that's the way to uh, kind of uh, learn to become even better. And, and so um, there needs to be some kind of critical mass brought together to. to uh, be able to attract. So I think, therefore, uh, for Europe, it is important to kind of build hubs that, that uh, have critical mass to, to support each other's talents. So, to, essentially, to, to, to bend the fabric of AI so that they start sliding back towards the, the centers, towards us. <laughs> uh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Question was about brain drain. Brain drain. What can we do about it? Uh, I think we well, we have seen 
some developments in, in this uh, way and, and some in the other way. For example, in, after the Brexit, we also attracted a lot of um, scientists from the UK. Uh, for example, a lot of people that from Germany that had been working in the UK came back after many years, people we never expected to see back. Um, so, uh, but of course, it's not exactly the, your question. But I think we are not that unattractive. Um, um, still, uh, when it when it comes to AI uh, developers, I mean, uh, this was mostly uh, not exclusively, but mostly about academia uh, in, in Brexit. Uh, maybe some some others maybe. Uh, but here it, we are we are mostly talking about uh, non-academic uh, people, and well. That is a question, indeed, what you just said. It's a question of where, where's the capital, uh, where, uh, where, is, where is the more private equity um, uh, funding, where's, where's the venture capital. We, we need to hopefully at, at arrive at some point at some, uh, some of this environment, environment that we have in Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, to some extent elsewhere as well. Um, I think there, this, this kind of, um, environment that comes from a network of, of different, mostly private uh, initiatives. We, uh, this is something which we should uh, aim at. And, uh, I'm not sure, we, we, I, I think we can do that. We, we should not become uh, too state-centric in Europe. That, that is the problem. I think that's, by the way, a good um, development that we um, uh, got new um, members of the EU in the, in the past years. Like Estonia, I think this is a very good thing to see that we are not we are not just stagnating in the EU. Also, in our mindsets that we keep to keep being yeah refreshed and hopefully refreshing in order to think of, of this entire um, um, our, in our our situation in Europe in new terms and not just this purely stage stage centric, centric um, um, thing. Okay, thank you, Hello. Yeah, I, I do agree that uh, that when we we cannot overpay the PP companies, then we have to offer or or bring up some other other values. I think those uh, some really cool or innovative projects uh, or or uh, different um, different uh, collaboration works uh, and and. And uh, and an ability to be uh, part of some sort of uh, community or, or network, uh, which uh, might not be not, not be possible in the in the private sector. I guess these are one one of the one of the keywords uh, just just to offer them some, some something other if we if we know that we cannot just overpay them. Thank you, Art. Yeah, so some of the things are, are at the political level, as you mentioned, Brexit was very useful for uh, going against the brain drain. Maybe if Trump go, is re-elected and the US really goes into self-destructive mode, then uh, it can also be very uh, helpful to, for bringing uh, people back uh, to Europe. But let me make the issue a little bit smaller. <clears throat> so I work at a uh, university. I've, I've always had uh, programmers in my team. So I've been working on, on uh, prototyping, bringing ideas also to prototypes. For instance, in the area of privacy-friendly authentication or new next generation social networks. Um, hiring programmers at a university is a challenge. <laughs> when you look at the salaries that the universities can, can offer for these programs in respect to uh, the, uh, the market. So that has always been a bit difficult. What I have been doing the last five years when I started hiring programmers and I have these uh, projects on authentication and social networks which are, which are more societally beneficial, I put it explicitly in the advertisements. Come and work here and you can work on, on issues which are societally beneficial, which, uh, which contribute to public values in the digital world. That works. That works remarkably well. So, so the, the reactions we get when we advertise also on these values are very positive, including some people who have worked in the private sector and, and reacted, I'm fed up uh, with the kind of work there. I've worked there for five years or 10 years or whatever. I'm, I'm willing to, pay, to take a pay cut in order to do sensible and meaningful work. 
people go for that and not at least some people some uh, some reasonable proportion of people go for that my impression also is i'm a bit older now but if i look at the current generation of students they like to work open source they 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 like to contribute to uh, to the world there's a certain pr uh, proportion that really wants to uh, i i have this uh, this silicon valley uh, style of, of working okay if they go there so so be it but this reinforces uh, i think the european approach that we should develop further invest in our own technology invest in in integrating embedding public value public european values in in that technology and people do want to work uh, for these kind of things it is my uh, impression but we should make this explicit and try to say, and say this and not only bang on this same uh, 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 commercial message uh, that has fields in this IT sector. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you. I think my point is clear. Um, so we, we discussed, we discussed um, fake news earlier today as well, and like how AI can be used to, to generate fake news um, and deep fakes and so on. And uh, as with, with, with fake news, you don't need AI for that, right? So just based on these responses right now, we can create um, fake news, super big headline, breaking, straight from Brussels, if you want to stop the brain drain, vote Trump, <laughs> right? All over the newspapers, all over the newspapers. Anywho, um, we have... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's fake news. <laughs> I just said it. I mean. <laughs> Um, so we have about uh, 40 minutes left, so we will open the floor now for questions and answers. Um, I will send the microphone around, so please raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and you will get a microphone. Thank you. Very thought-provoking. I have a double question. Uh, in, 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 in the morning, some of the keynote speakers mentioned that uh, uh, the first idea of AI came in the time of uh, sci-fi and Isaac Asimov and, 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 and the like. At that very time, um, the nuclear power was a hype. And according to that sci-fi, today we will be driving nuclear cars. We are not. And I can imagine how many years ago somebody put a risk pyramid and uh, somewhere on the top were nuclear bombs, the nuclear power stations, and then suddenly nothing because nothing is safe. So we are not there. It feels like we commoditized AI a bit too early, and now uh, we're having our iPhones and uh, our, our other mobile devices and not mobile devices, a technology that is still a black box to our, those who measure the risks, to those who use the, risk, uh, the, the technology, to everyone for us. So the question is, <clears throat> Or uh, if it's already commoditized, isn't trustworthiness of AI uh, a social problem rather than a technical problem? Because when we discuss uh, trustworthy AI here, it makes sense for, uh, let's say, professionals in the bubble. For a user, it's a matter of whether I trust uh, Google or Apple or government or whoever owns the data. And my ideas about whether I can trust AI or not depends on who is handling it. And continuing that analogy with that, or with, with, with nuclear, um, do I trust, let's say, Elon Musk that he will be following the ethical regulations uh, when it will be choice between ethics and money? I am biased, I would say no, as well as I would say I'm not really trust, uh, uh, find, find uh, likely that Iran will be using nuclear power only for the, for the peaceful purposes. So when it comes to trust to AI uh, at the general public level, doesn't it just come to the trust the companies or the governments or whoever owns them? Because we cannot tell uh, Android or, 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 or Windows from AI, and they are converging more and more. So so who would like to answer? Like who, who is it addressed to? Who is your question? Anyone who is willing to, to answer. I Sorry. think it's for you, Christoph. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a few words. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I think that uh, the trust is only uh, related to who owns the system. 
I guess people tend to trust something that works well. When uh, when one car works well, then then we trust that it that it's a good car or or whatever. So so when there are the social media platforms which work really well, but they are not trusted, but because they work well and then they uh, deliver some some other uh, some other values for those users, uh, people still uh, tend to use them. So that's I guess one one of the one of the tasks to to protect the society in in some way uh, because when when there are really good solutions that might might be untrustworthy but uh, not trustworthy uh, and people still might use them uh, because they have this big trust or they're not uh, even uh, even knowledgeable of, of what data they share with those uh, with those companies. Uh, I, I also think that uh, we, we should separate the trust in the kind of the AI system itself and and then whoever runs it or owns it or, or, or controls it uh, because uh, it can be that the AI system is trustworthy but whoever runs it isn't but it can also be the other way around and, and I think these are quite different situations and um, of course to um, eventually uh, earn the trust of a user we need both but, uh, but we should keep them also partly separable uh, at least when we are thinking of solutions how to achieve that trust maybe we, we need to have solutions for both sides Thank you, Thank you. Thanks. Um, you referred a few times to the need for explainability and uh, transparency. And I was wondering, in your mind, what is the threshold for explainability? Would it be, for example, when you persuade uh, someone, let's say a healthcare professional, when she is persuaded to follow the decision of the AI, would that be? the threshold for explainability. And I'm saying that because there was research, for example, showing AI systems which were explainable, and even when they were giving their own explanation, they tended to be, be, to be relied on and believed by humans. Or even there was research showing that when the explanation is really nice, humans are more biased to follow the nice explanation and really rely on that one, even when the explanation is wrong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So maybe I can take that question, because that's a, that's a really very interesting one, since explainability is also an issue that's both researched on the technical level, of course, uh, but it's also a non-technical issue. It's a, it's a question how it is worded. Uh, um, and and in, indeed, uh, it takes and, and I have seen those studies as well. It takes a lot of, how do you say, maybe courage or whatever to, to uh, decide against uh, the system. And in particular, so if you also got a nice explanation why you should do this and that. Uh, and, but um, this is something that should be taken into account, indeed, when, when, um, when developing um, uh, software or interfaces for software that that are about explainability. Yeah, because you can't rule out that the system has got it wrong or, or goes in the wrong direction. And, and this is, it depends a lot on the level we are talking about and, and the, the particular system. Uh, a responsible doctor, for example, when, when uh, they get uh, the data from, from some person, it's, it's a question, how, how do you interpret it? Um, you have maybe 60% uh, probability of developing cancer. How do you, how do you communicate that to the patient? Or if it's a 45% or whatever, or 80%. And I think human responsibility is still, it, it is important. That, that's why we also have the, the um, well, human in the loop uh, or human oversight, all, all these aspects uh, that are very important. But of course, they, they come into play in different parts depending on the system we are talking about. Thank you. Any more questions? Well? Great. Hi. 
Thanks, and thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I'm not sure if intentional or otherwise, but I just wanted to ask about the role of civil society in all of this, because um, it obviously strikes me as pretty critical, particularly in the European context, because it sets us apart from a lot of other actors um, internationally. So yeah, if you could just articulate a bit your thoughts on that, that would be really useful. Thank you. Me or hey, the chairman? Anyone, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very happy you, you raised this. Uh, Christoph said, uh, 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 said to me that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the public sector uh, 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 is not a solution. I never said that the public sector is a, uh, uh, a solution. I think civil society has a, has a big role to play also in this area and indeed especially in Europe. So I think it should be a mix of private, public and, and civil sector uh, uh, initiative and I'm happy you emphasize uh, that. And civil sector can often be, uh, I mean, inspired by uh, scientific research and, and can, uh, can use the benefits from this. Uh, a, a big challenge remains in the AI sector, what Pavel also mentioned. I mean, setting up these, these large language models to take an example and training them is so costly, so costly that it's not realistic that this will come somehow from civil society alone. So there will be some some other initiatives needed to to uh, to organize this. Anyone else wants to? If not, then um, that concludes the um, panel and the QA. Thank you to all the panelists. <laughs> and now I think it's time to time to wrap up.